we've got everyone right. that we are thinking of uh, having in our room number one. Okay, so uh, if you uh, agree, we might tell one or two sentences about us to know each other, you know, where we are from and and what sort of uh, experience do you have? So um, let me start with myself. Um, so I uh, am from a Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, um, headquarter in Canberra, the capital of Australia, where um, I'm now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's night outside, so, <laughs> so you know the time difference. Um, and Catherine has uh, very kindly uh, spoke about my uh, work and, um, and the uh, mission that I have uh, shared with you uh, that I'm currently involved with. So uh, that's me. Uh, if uh, Nure, if you uh, say about you a little bit. Hello, uh, my name is Nurai. Uh, I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. Uh, I work for a uh, Turkish Water Institute, which is uh, under uh, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, and Forestry. It's a governmental institute, but uh, it is like a think tank. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer and uh, I'm complete uh, beginner for earth observations, but uh, I've been uh, using hydrological models uh, for, for uh, 10 years, uh, so uh, it is uh, it is really important to learn art observations to uh, get some data for models. But still, uh, I'm a little bit uh, anxious about uh, how correct uh, data from satellites. But uh, I'm trying to learn about uh, learn more about uh, art observations and how uh, I can use them in my. Uh, current work so uh thank you very much uh you uh, for this uh, beautiful event thank you well thank you anure um i think we know we know, we know a little bit about uh, catherine but if catherine if you want to if you want to say uh, uh anything please um yeah I, um i guess in some of the other work that i'm doing with the australian water partnership um which is with the MRC, the Mekong River Commission Regional Flood and Drought Management Center. Uh, they are particularly interested in using um, information from something called Mekong Dam Monitor, which is developed by Stimson, which is a US-based organization. And, um, but yeah, it's interesting because um, they're using, basically the Mekong Dam Monitor is looking at um, levels of, well, storage levels in, in dams across the Mekong, including upstream in China. So there are geopolitical <laughs> sensitivities in addition to the science. So it's, uh, um, so this is just something interesting that uh, I just thought I'd share because it's, uh, it's a, an additional element because the data is important because the, the countries are not sharing data with each other, but right, at the yeah. same time, there's this geopolitical sensitivities. Um, mm. So it's 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 mostly quantity, Catherine. Yeah, that that's focusing it's, on quantity. Yeah, it's, it's the quantity. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go to uh, Philip. Uh, good morning. Good evening, <laughs> um, everybody. Um, my name is Philip De Souza. I'm from a small company uh, called Imanti Management. We're based on uh, in the Western Cape of Southern Africa, of South Africa. Um, yeah, uh, I, I experience uh, around, um, you know, earth observation data is, is more around almost the, the, the kind of practical application thereof. Um, we have, uh, you know, we do a lot of work on uh, things like water safety planning. So kind of risk management for water supply and, and wastewater sanitation systems. And now looking at the impact of uh, climate variability and change on those systems. So, you know, um, it's almost not like the, the kind of like nuts and bolts interface that we've been seeing today, but almost like uh, trying to understand, you know, what tools um, are available for um, our water service authorities, which are largely municipalities to, to try and access so that they can draw 
quick and easy conclusions. Uh, we all know that uh, you know there is uncertainty within these models and so forth. But the whole point is that you know some information um, should be better than no information. Um, and so we want to you know get um, our utilities uh, in essence on the right path uh, to make sure that they are considering uh, climate variability and change and building that into um, you know the way they, they operate the infrastructure infrastructure the way they design and build new infrastructure so it's just trying to change their way of thinking um, yeah so so obviously interested in in trying to you know there's there's so many models and systems out there and and we're always looking at uh, you know uh, uh, what is useful what is easy for um, uh, people to to kind of absorb and and get to those conclusions because i think that's the tricky thing is is the so what it's like all these fancy models and that looks wonderful but so what how do i use this and that's the the question we continue to ask ourselves and, and try to answer thank you thank you thank you philip it's a powerful message any model is as good as it has got data to validate. And, you know, in many countries, as you are aware, that we don't have a good um, storehouse of data. Yeah, there, there, there are people that lack data. But I, I guess um, the art observation has such a powerful um, opportunity, I, I would I'd say, uh, even though we know that there are not much uh, good data available, but still um, it gives us um, information that will help, as you said, Philip, decision maker, um, you know, to start somewhere with, rather than without having any information. So thank you very much. Um, may I now go to Lars Boy Hansen? Yes, hello everyone. Um, yes, my name is is Lars Boyer Hansen. I'm uh, I'm with DHI, uh, an international consultancy company, um, um, a company mainly uh, known for, for for their developments on uh, on on modeling software. Um, yeah, there's, there's a brand called called Mike, uh, where there are different uh, numerical models. Uh, uh, across a number of uh, themes, uh, urban environment, uh, water resources, uh, wastewater treatment, and so on, marine, and, and, and all that. And I, I really like uh, the comments uh, raised so far about the, the linkage between data and models, um, because that's, that's basically why my department was established within DHI. Uh, uh, we were established um, 22 years ago, uh, there was an early recognition that uh, there's a lot of potential in the use of Earth observation. Um, so this, my my department was established to, to sort of try and uh, extract as much information of this uh, new back then uh, data source um, and try and see if we could link it to, to the modeling community. And I should say the First 15 years, this was a slow process, um, but I think uh, since, I don't know, um, 2015 or something, a lot has really happened, uh, um, both on the data side, on the capability side, and, and so on. So, so now we see a, a huge move towards this integration of, of different uh, data types and, and sensors and, and so on. Uh, and for me, that's a really big point in, in, in the combination of different types because, well, it's true that the, all data have flaws, you could say, but by combining it, the, my argument is that you, you get a much more complete picture of, uh, of the reality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, concretely, we've uh, been working a lot with the European Space Agency uh, over the past 20 years. Um, We've run a few uh, flagship projects uh, recently. Um, we were priming the Earth Observation for, for Sustainable Development uh, project on, um, on water resources. Uh, we were running the Globe Wetland Africa uh, initiative, um, and we are currently running the World Water um, uh, initiative through the European Space Agency. Yeah, I think that was... Uh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, uh, we will we'll talk later because uh, 
we do buy um, software from you guys in CSIRO. And you do charge us, you do charge us quite heavily. Ah, but you get a lot of uh, value for your money also, I'm sure. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, probably uh, <laughs> outside this meeting. Um, may I uh, now uh, go to um, Mariano um, I mean, Sorry to interrupt. I would just like to point out that there's five more minutes left for part one of this session. Fantastic. I think uh, we have uh, the last speaker, uh, Mariano, to share. So Mariano, please tell about yourself and share uh, your work that you think um, uh, is um, kind of linked to today's uh, workshop. Me? Sorry, I don't understand. Yes, 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 ah, Mariano. It's okay. No, no, I don't understand Nabila. What, uh, hello to everybody. I'm Mariano Bresciani. I'm a researcher in National Research Council in Italy. I'm ecologist expert in uh, remote sensing. I collaborate uh, with uh, IWA in a different H2020 project. Uh, one of uh, these is uh, Prime Water, previously uh, mentioned uh, by Catherine. Inside of uh, Prime Water, we use uh, different type of data in order to better acknowledge uh, the status of uh, different uh, uh, water in uh, lake and reservoir. In particular, uh, I'm expert uh, in the passive uh, satellite data, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, and new hyperspectral data. And uh, I think it's very important to have the possibility to integrate uh, satellite and modeling data, obviously with in situ data in order to expand the information in terms of uh, vertical information from in situ and modeling, uh, spatial information from uh, remote sensing data, and uh, with a frequent uh, revisiting time, uh, both uh, with uh, new in situ technology, such as the CSIRO uh, hyperspectral instrument that we have uh, similar in uh, Italian lakes, uh, and uh, with the high frequency of uh, satellite uh, data. Respect to previously mentioned by Philip, uh, in, the, um, in this period, uh, different uh, company, different researcher create uh, different tools uh, in order to use satellite data. I think uh, it's very important to have the possibility to use this uh, big amount of data provided by NASA, ESA, and uh, other uh, space agency to, to have uh, uh, important uh, knowledge uh, of uh, our font of life, that is the water. And uh, some of this is completely free. For example, for, uh, from uh, Italian, from uh, European Space Agency, uh, we have the possibility to use uh, SNAP. Uh, it's a very easy interface uh, to processing uh, uh, satellite data, such as Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, but Landsat, for example. Uh, NASA provide uh, different products. Some years ago, working remote sensing because it's all uh, level one, it's a radiance uh, and uh, complicated data. In these uh, years, uh, we have uh, reflectances, uh, we have chlorophyll A products, uh, total suspended matter products. Uh, it's very easy to access and use. Sometimes it's, the product is not perfect because uh, sometimes happen that there is a um, use it globally algorithms and non specific uh, regional algorithm that uh, is most uh, is uh, higher accurate for the different case studies. But they think is a good start to use satellite data. In South Africa, for example, I know. Uh, and I have a contact uh, with uh, some researcher, for example, uh, Mark Matthews uh, or uh, Bernard, that is uh, one of the lead of EOCCG. 
and uh, many information uh, is obtained and was obtained from satellite data for the different uh, case studies. For uh, my point of view, uh, apart uh, Prime Water, we are in my institute and we are involved in the CCI project. It's a very important uh, project from ESA. And one of uh, the project is uh, related to the lakes and uh, provide uh, products for completely free for uh, more or less 2,000 lakes in the world for different parameters uh, inside of uh, CCI lakes. Uh, the parameter is not only obtained uh, with passive uh, satellite, uh, but uh, include active satellite. Uh, the product uh, is uh, chlorophyll A, turbidity, surface temperature, uh, altimetry, and uh, size, uh, the highs present, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we are in the phase two of the project uh, and a part of the option activities uh, for the different case studies. One of that is uh, strictly related to the Africa in order to understand uh, the changing in, uh, with a long time series, uh, uh, the water quality in Africa due to the climate change. Because it's a thank you. thank you, thank you, Mariano. I think we almost ran out of our allotted time. May I now request our um, last but not the least person, Navila, uh, to introduce um, yourself, please. Hi there. Um, my name is Navila Karim. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize my video wasn't on. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nabila and I am from Cape Town, South Africa. I work at Sitari in the water treatment department um, and it's my first year. So I've only been here for a few months. I don't have much experience, but hope I can learn a lot from all of you. Indeed, indeed. Now that's that's very nice. Um, nice of you, uh, Nabila, and thank you for helping me out in this uh, conversation. So I uh, would... Um, um, I suggest that um, we have uh, uh, Navila to take uh, our comments, our experience, um, you know, and, and we will further discuss them um, in the general session. So if, uh, um, if you guys are happy for me to um, close this session, we'd like to close and move to the general session. Um, Takas, I, I think that there's a second question because um, we still have a few more minutes. Is that correct? Is yes, there? yes. We have 15 minutes for um, part two, which is, do you have any suggestions on what you can contribute to the COP? How you how the COP for, how can the COP further share information such as webinars, white paper, podcasts, and can you volunteer? So we have 15 minutes for that, and then we're going to leave the breakout room. Yes, it will be a really good. Yeah, I think I think we have probably eight minutes now. Well, yeah, um, yeah, we have. Yeah, we minutes. don't, we don't, we don't have that many minutes. Okay, so, um, mm. so the so I can give a bit of insight because I helped think of these questions. So the the idea behind it is, um, so um, so we have this community of practice, but um, and we have such a, a breadth of experience, um. So the idea is um, if, if you yourselves or if you think of things that other people could do in terms of um, uh, contributing to, for, to be able to further share information. So for example, in other groups that we have on digital water, there's um, development of white papers or um, it could be webinars on specific topics or it could be another discussion like this, but on something more specific. So that, that was the idea behind it, just to give you some context. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, uh, Catherine. And I think um, on the top of that, um, we, I mean, I came to know yesterday that there are about 260 plus people registered. And I'm guessing that perhaps half of them in this session and the another half will be uh, at the next session that will start um, my midnight. <laughs> However, um, I would also um, request you to let others know, I mean, you know, in terms of um, 
circulation of email or um, information exchange program. If you can um, get other people aware of this community of practice, um, and then you know they can join, they can suggest, oh, well, we want to know more about a particular aspect of art observation um, sort of thing, and then um, IWA, COP will be able to uh, assist you with, uh, with that sort of information, but also um, as um, Katrin said that, yep, if you would like to organize a webinar um, or especially if there is a special um, workshop or seminar happening, if there is an event going on and you know it's, it's relevant to what uh, this community of practice is all about, and then by all means, please let us know so that you know we we are more informed sort of things. And I think uh, Lars, you do have um, quite a bit of um, training um, program and um, information um, session um, that I do get email. Um, you know, some of them are not relevant uh, to what we're talking about, but uh, but definitely um, some of them are relevant to. Uh, mm -hmm. this this particular group so you may because you are on the um on the executive committee you would like to share them uh, mm -hmm. share them yeah. with the uh, what do you call with uh, uh, Goida um, Samuela or Erin sort of things and they can then circulate to us well, certainly and I'm, I'll be happy to do that um, of course we need to find the balance on uh, information overflow uh, yeah. we all get tired of all these uh, promotional emails also so you need to to find the, the proper balance and that's that's maybe something i would like uh, a bit of uh, feedback on from 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 the general group here um yeah. what's the how, how often do you want to get disturbed or i mean what's when does it go from being uh, informative to to annoying uh, quite frankly um, no, I do, I do, I do fully um, appreciate. We do, uh, we do get bombardment of uh, you know events, and there are large number of EU activities happening all over the yes, world. Yes. There is GEO, there is Asian GEO, uh, there is European Commission, and and then American NASA Space Center. So, you know, often you're right, Lars. I think this is a good point that we don't, you know. Um, mm get fatigued by, <laughs> by information. Right, um, anyone has any uh, other experience or opinion that you would like to share? Uh, I think we still have uh, probably another five minutes, uh, Catherine. There's two minutes left for this session. Oh, um, I think it okay. might run a bit longer because it started late. But um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Thank you, Nabila. No, I, let, let, let me see if, if, if others was, would like to share yeah, anything I mean, else. I, I can just from my other work, I, I think, yeah, I guess maybe just like, for example, we had um, presentations today on different examples of application of Earth observation. I think that's quite helpful um, to understand how, um, how Earth observation is being used in different places um, uh, through, through different tools. Um, I think understanding how um, yeah, Earth observation, for example, is used in modeling and forecasting, um, but also how um, ground data um, is used to verify Earth observation and, you know, you know, if it, kind of what is your how can I explain like if you have gaps in your data, how much can it, how much you rely on Earth observation versus ground data and, and that mix like how does that mix work. I, that's something I would be interested in in learning about more, for example. Yes, and and I'm with you, and uh, this is one uh, difficulties that we have had uh, ground truthy. Uh, there are lots of, uh, you know, quote claimed analysis ready data unquote but i don't know how much of that is properly calibrated um, and particularly for water quality and this is one thing 
that I do see people are claiming that they can do um, dissolved phosphorus in water, they can do heavy metals in water. And um, gee, I mean, you know, those are the things we need to be careful um, of uh, selling the idea that, uh, that we can only do certain things, but at, as of now, we cannot do certain things. Yeah, I think understanding that difference is important when navigating yeah. this. See, we're going to end in about 30 seconds. That's right. I came. So let me take this opportunity to thank you um, for all your um, uh, uh, experience sharing and your opinion and your contribution. I very much appreciate. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. Uh, we have just a small uh, exercise uh, to make it more interactive uh, since we can all speak at the same time. Uh, I've put a small link on the chat. It's small jumbo, which helps us to like uh, share our experiences. Uh, otherwise, so that we don't miss out these important projects that you might have or collaboration opportunities, uh, which will be shared in the plenary uh, with everybody. So as you can see from my screen, it's just a, a link that it's anonymous. Uh, you can put your elephant project or any project or any stuff that you might know. Uh, then we can start putting it on this particular board as well. Also, the well, uh, for, for the purposes of introduction, I see we have, uh, uh, I have myself, Kenneth Bobea from Digital Africa. I'm joined by Victor Busu and Dr. Samuela Weda from AWA. Then also I'm joined by Andrei, uh, Linda, Santiago, and Isabella. Uh, for example, uh, Andrea can start with a small introduction about where he works and this, the amazing stuff he's doing. Um, yeah, just one second. <laughs> I'm trying to do the jam board in the same time. Uh, so, well, thank you. As Linda said, we are both part of the same organization, which is called DoSpace. It's a foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, and then we're presently involved uh, with uh, two projects focusing on water. The first one is Water Force. Uh, which is a coordination and support action Horizon 2020 project, um, which um, the, the topic is uh, setting up um, um, the next uh, Copernicus services uh, for inland water. Uh, and then we just finished the first uh, work package of the project where we look at policies, but also uh, at business opportunities between Europe and the world. And then we came across uh, with a lot of um, tools, but also we come across a lot of uh, ways the, that uh, policies or businesses they are supporting earth observation uh, data uh, to be used for water resources or um, uh, water quality. Uh, and also we recently started another project, which is another European project, which is called Iliad, which is the digital uh, twin of the ocean. Um, this is quite fresh, but the ambition is to set up um, uh, digital kick of the ocean, which will stem into the next uh, di digital twin of Europe, which is called Destination Earth. Thank you, Andre. And I think in the same order, uh, your colleague will talk. Yeah, so my name is Linda van Dijkmoor. So my, my camera doesn't, my webcam doesn't work. Uh, as far as I can do my laptop. Uh, yeah, also a Dot Space Foundation, Netherlands. In addition to what Andre already said, it's an open innovation network and platform. I'll put the, maybe Andre, you can do it on a sticky note. Uh, put the ground station dot space. Yes. So we have a, a platform where we give space to remote sensing initiative, not just our own projects, but also articles. So if any of you say, well, I'd like to post something about the work I'm doing, and we're happy to do that in our kind of our open innovation, open collaboration platform. We uh, our our objective is to unlock the market for remote sensing applications. This is what uh, Lisa was asked, and which we recognize fully that the difficulty in uh, in getting users to trust and work with uh, Earth observation data is a big hurdle, so it's not just the technology, but it's the visualization. That's why, Kenneth, I, I really like your Digital Earth initiative, because I think making information visible and actionable for decision makers who are not experts in Earth observation 
is uh, is really critical uh, to stimulate the uptake. And with more uptake come more come more requirements, and therefore also more investment into new sensors, new data applications. So that's something else we we try to do, and we do it by giving platform uh, to to stories or to projects or to use cases, and we do it by developing projects. Uh, such as uh, or taking part in projects. So we do like uh, space for smart cities. Water is one of our important topics because we're based in the Netherlands and water here is critical. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much, Linda. And uh, we appreciate the uh, great work from H220 uh, Copernicus program. And also we are aware about the 2035 program which is coming. So these are quite some work from Europe. I wish to recognize Santiago and uh, CNS in France. Uh, he can introduce himself. And yeah. The work. Hi, everyone. So I'm Santiago. I'm in the French space agency called CNES. And here I'm in a team developing new applications for around hydrology. Um, in a historic way, CNES always work just on the instruments and new new sensors and this time we are working for the SWOT satellite which will change a little bit with new data for hydrology it will be a satellite capable of providing water elevations but in a global way up to now we had like nadir altimetry which was quite limited in coverage for but it was still quite useful with all the json satellite sentinel 3 and so on but SWOT satellite will be able to provide a global coverage for all rivers and lakes around the world every 21 days, new measurements two, three times, depending on the latitude. So we are developing new uh, water products that will be provided also with the SWOT data. So we have also water surfaces. We're working in new, new algorithms for water quality. So we have different teams and we have, um, we're working especially with uh, French laboratories to develop such products. So just to remember the, the way the portal that we will have will be called HydroWeb uh, Next. We have already one HydroWeb based on natural altimetry. The idea will be to have the next generation, which is called this HydroWeb Next. Thank you so much, Santiago. I also have uh, persons from uh, DWS in South Africa. Yeah, oh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, in South Africa, actually within the department, we are busy with the development of the national eutrophication strategy to be specific. That's where my interest is. And we, are, we need to venture into Earth observation uh, eutrophication monitoring program. So currently we are still doing the grape sample kind of manual uh, um, water quality sample. We take that to the laboratory for analysis. So we realized that we are actually missing a uh, time lag in between. By the time we are you know, driving to the site, a lot could have happened compared to the earth observation of which the piloting was done already by, by Mark. That's where we are. Thanks. Thank you so much. Just as a context, I know it's quite a pains and gains of doing manual testing, and maybe you don't even know where to test. So at least uh, at observation, like uh, you using the Sentinel-2, you can just have an assessment of where you need to go to the ground and do further testing, and also from the colleagues in the call who might have some programs uh, on the same. Uh, anyone else who's been left out? Samuela? No, Sam I think uh, everyone everyone had the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, also yeah. Do I like to talk as well? Because also you're a practitioner. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you. So in I just added a little sticker of the Prime Water European Project. And the, um, the Prime Water European Project looks at the heart observation for water quality and quantity management. Um, so you are, you're welcome to go to the website and check um, what the project is about. Thank you so much, Samuela. And I think the group is doing very well. So with the guidance of the group, uh, I wish to ask for suggestions for this first COP. For example, I put some sticker, a webinar, white paper. Would you also like a mailing list, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, how uh, how would Samuela like us to continue with her guidance? <laughs> yes, so the idea of the second part of this breakout room is to see 
um, what do you think the COP um, should go? Um, what, how can you contribute to the COP or um, what do you think the COP should do? So considering that we want to um, um, uh, share information on uh, heart observation or different type of, um, of heart observation data and technology. So what do you think um, could be useful for that for the rest of the members? And the, um, so uh, any um, suggestion on um, any product that you would like to see, for example, a blog series or um, a, a blog series of a podcast series. So what, what do you think uh, could be useful in this scope? And I actually like the idea of the board, um, Kenneth. So thank you for that. Don't worry, uh, Samuela, we've, we've been in this online for a while, uh, actually worked <laughs> the last three years virtually. So this is just a, a plus because uh, previously I was working for the UN Foundation. Now I'm working for the Geoscience Australia. Mm -hmm. So really have to work remotely to reach our users as much as possible. Uh, then also for colleagues in uh, from Europe, I am aware there is a lot of Copernicus SDGs and I know maybe you might have heard. So I think also through IWA is that we already have a lot of uh, segments, just uh, IWA is trying to bring us together because mm -hmm. there are many conversations. Even I had a colleague from, uh, uh, joined from uh, the UNEP, World Water Quality Alliance, of which I, I, I sent a message around to know some of the stuff around and they normally provide some ground data based on what has been provided by the member states. Um, so just a question to go around the room. Uh, do you think uh, um, the, these meetings, these kind of meetings um, work? Do you have any feedback on this? Um, would you see the COP doing more of these meetings? Any um, ideas from the room? So I'm also typing in some sticky notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, most definitely. I mean, uh, we came we, we we found this one through our water force project so the horizon 2020 project we're part of so yeah. um they're always looking out for water related uh, uh events and sort of last minute decided to join it and, and luckily also andre and nina who's in a different group um and it just exposes you to a whole new community because we're very European based, I, I recognize this. And, and so your viewpoint is very European and you just don't know what's going on in the rest of the world, not, not enough because it's, there's so much going on that, that we're not aware of. And, and this helps tremendously. And also yes. just to say that uh, we started also a community of, uh, of, of, of users or, or stakeholders uh, ourselves. Uh, and then, yeah, I think it's also maybe good to, to connect at this level as well because uh, this community actually brings a lot of experience and knowledge uh, in, 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 to scientific areas, but also um, worldwide uh, representation. Yeah, yeah. so from uh, most program perspectives, uh, this is what we encountered as a challenge in the continent was, uh, as uh, my colleague from South Africa said, most of them have to do manual testing, uh, for example, the case of water quality, and it's based on information. So the citizens will complain, oh, we have a lot of algae, we've seen these lakers, it's not, nothing is happening. So there's an element of ground science and also bring in some interest to politicians who've been in parliament and they're not talking about their issues in the ground. So the people are being empowered to communicate more, to report. And from that, agencies can actually go and try to collect the other side of the platforms, like many we use in Earth Observation, is uh, there's another scope of scientists, like my colleagues from Geoscience Australia. The algorithms they have developed to be used using Earth Observation. So it depends on how many of them are open to the public to be used. So there's another question for IWA to look at those areas. So we also had also from our, our side at NASA, where there's a scientist who developed this algorithm for ocean uh, and he was not very keen to share some of the algorithms to go to the open data cubes. So those are the uh, people in the silos and they are, we understand they are funded by different programs and there's much they can share from what we provide. So we provide from what is available open and free to first support the governments. And from there, they can talk to projects like CNS, what they're doing to be supported further. Well, there is another point on those COP meetings. There's, we are still lacking maybe those future and potential users and this is quite difficult to to maybe to convince and to have like a huge community behind 
because they have so many other inputs coming from other institutions, other lobbies or everything. So maybe what I see all the time that we are always like data providers or algorithm providers or people trying to, to cope with this death valley of use of spatial data. I see now I discovered these new platforms that are, for instance, this Digital Earth Africa. I discovered it today and I think it's incredible. This is huge quantity of information, well displayed and, uh, and it has a really big potential, but still, it's, I don't know. I still see that it's quite difficult to, to have all those institutions here uh, supporting us and trying to to, to do, asking or begging for more data and what we see is like as Linda said the, there is a big space for uh, maybe private companies uh, ready to distill all this data to provide the, the, the right answer the right indicator especially for each of those or uh, uh, public institutions or the, the policy makers and so on so this is just an observation no new ideas but um, I, I think I discovered today this new community and we will try to, with our colleagues from HydroWeb and so on, from CNES, we'll try to, to be more present about that. In the, in the past, it was Ali, Ali Sandral, who was in the community. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, so, um, any other um, ideas uh, I see here um, link with not European voter initiative and the um, calls to action to politics? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if we would be, maybe it's a bit outside the scope of this community, but what we find uh, here in Europe in uh, public, the public sector, which should be a big uh, customer for certain companies. I mean, I, we know that they work with research organizations, but uh, we, we have this slogan, which we call from innovation to operation. So it's, it's all very well to have something new like Earth Observation and to have new products uh, uh, being developed by research institutes. But until you get it into an operational environment, it, it remains too, too bitty, too ad hoc. But we also know that public authorities, uh, uh, I guess everywhere, but certainly here in Europe, they have to adhere to quite strict procurement rules. So we have the European Procurement Directive uh, which uh, dictates how public authorities buy services or, or products or data. Uh, and that everyone has their routine. So in, in your organization, you come into a, a routine and it's comfortable, you know how to do it. Uh, and then if someone comes along with something new, you go like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm, how is it going to help me? What's it going to cost? So even the effort of finding out about it is uh, is, is often too much. Uh, so you need some kind of uh, uh, open-minded people in organizations who even want to know about it. Uh, and then they have to be able to write it into their uh, technical specifications or procurement specifications to be able to buy it on, on a routine basis. And we at Dot Space firmly believe that until we get it into real operational services, we are we are in this technology push era where we, we keep saying to people, yeah, this is amazing. It's going to really help you. Um, so for us, procurement and, and making those buyers understand not just what they can buy, but also how they can buy it. Uh, so through like a buyer groups uh, is, is also very, uh, very important to really get the market uptake going. And I'm interested to hear, because I think uh, there's a lady from DWS, which I think is a, a government organization in South Africa, how, how, it's, how it works in, uh, in your country. Do you have something similar where you have certain procurement rules to follow? How willing are people to, to, to write something new? I mean, typically you have already specifications of what you want to buy. And it's easier to reuse what you have than to spend time in creating something new. Can you say a little bit about how that works in South Africa? Uh, thanks. Eh? It's actually working the same in terms of community of practice. Uh, we do have uh, strategic water networks. We do have uh, okay cooperative governance in terms of private public partnership as well. So. I think it's also embedded in the legislation that uh, we really need to focus on citizen science as well, mm -hmm. bringing all the you know civil society 
into decision making kind of a thing. So it's actually the same to an extent that uh, every technical project we embark on. So we have the duty to include uh, a community of practice. So we have different levels of uh, engagement. You will have a, a little bit of a technical like uh, project steering committee. Then you have public meetings. You have uh, cage management forum meetings, depending on how you pitch your technical information into to filter through the um, different communities. So we pitch as well the, the tools we are taking to the people in terms of the presentation then we'll also have to scale it down to the um, common language kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's the same principle. Maybe the question will be how far are we in terms of percentages, in terms of the, you know, a future target. Okay, we have about uh, four minutes remaining. So if you have any other um, input that you would like to share, and uh, um, Kenneth, um, I don't know if you want to share um, some, some thoughts about this or um, um, any other um, ideas, please, this is the time. I think from everyone who has spoken, the ideas are good. So the other issue will be how uh, the barriers, like if it's a webinar, how often, and do you allow for translation, for example, my colleague from CNS, at least he's speaking both languages. Uh, for example, we had guys from another continent. So it is a, it's becoming quite a real uh, challenge for uh, connecting with other persons, like the case in Africa, where we have uh, Francophone and Anglophone. So yes. for some countries, we are very lucky. Like my, with my sister in South Africa, we speak good English. But in other countries, like in the West, French and uh, in the Central Africa now, it's even a different kind of French, which Santiago will be laughing all through. <laughs> yes, so we uh, we are we, we are using this uh, um, translation now uh, more and more often, especially during the the pandemic when we went completely remote we, we we had to learn so this is something that we can do and um, I saw people in the chat that were really interested in your um Kenneth in your um, automatic translation so um any information also that you can provide on that I think will be more than useful for us and for future meetings I'm not sure if this can be done um, just in presentation mode, I guess, just when you present. I think there's a feature for Zoom, but it's quite an issue of an app and some license. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. this this we do in, in the webinars, but in the meetings, in the presentation, I've never seen it. So I think it's very useful. OK, so I'll, um, um, I, I think we, we have uh, discussed a lot. Thank you all for uh, for your um, contribution. I'll ask uh, when we go back into the uh, main session, Kenneth and uh, um, uh, Nabila, if you want to provide a bit of a summary of what uh, um, of what happened during this uh, breakout room. Uh, but I'll uh, I'll bring you all into the main session now. So just just stay there. I'll 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 do it automatically. Is, is anyone saving the uh, chat function? Uh, I think they'll also save. But also, if you want the link to this, uh, yeah, this Jumbo, cool. it's, it's an anonymous link that you can actually oh, copy and uh, export from anywhere you are. Okay, yeah, I saved it. Now I see. Now I need to find out how I find it again. But yeah, the tra I thought the translation was very interesting, Kenneth. So I'd like to know more because this this is something we also heard in our project. But just yeah. English is not good enough. Yeah, it's a feature in the office uh, because also like things are really changing hmm. great so maybe we just get started so Uncle Betsy, what do we have is it half an hour we've got could you just keep an eye on the time yes we have 30 minutes and 15 minutes in each session okay great thanks yeah so welcome again nina um is it Khalid and zena um so yeah, so really the, the, the objective of the breakout rooms, um, as this is um, discussing a community of practice, is to get some input from, um, from all of you as well. So we'd really like to hear about your experiences um, on projects, initiatives um, related to the topic, so related to understanding different types, applications of earth observation data. 
Um, how have you used them? How do you plan to use them? Um, yeah, anything you'd like to share would be really useful. And you can either do that in the chat or if you'd like to just um, talk to us, then, then that's also great. Um, and we'll just be, yeah, we're, we're recording the session and we'll just be taking notes as well so that we can add it all into the, the general community of practice information. Um, so has anyone got anything they, they'd like to share in, in terms of experience, projects, programs? Or does anyone want to get us going? Because I'm sure the reason why you're all part of the community of practice is because you do, you do have experiences um, or interests or needs. Um, so yeah. Who wants to start or should I just ask someone to start? I can go for it, Nina. I can raise my hand virtually or <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I can reality. see you. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, my background's a bit different. I'm not a water practitioner per se. Um, but what I've been doing is I've been doing consultancy for an EU project called Water Force which is looking into um, the link between Copernicus, the Copernicus program and water users, if I can like, put them all together in a big box. So um, yeah, my interest is at the moment, I mean, sort of our initial, initial analysis is showing that sort of, especially the inland water sector is very mm -hmm. badly represented represented in the Copernicus program. I mean, it's always been, it's always tagged on to some or other Copernicus service, or it's part of the land service yeah. and closely linked to agriculture, or it's part of the, you know, marine service as where's where coastal issues come into. So, I mean, there's nothing, uh, there's no strong initiative just for, and this, this project is looking particularly at inland waters. And so, you know, we're trying to understand why and what's missing and what can be done. And so that's why I'm, I'm attending this to just to try and see, you know, pick up hints and tips and see if we're missing anything. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, and are you looking globally or you're focusing as is the Copernicus program on Europe? No, it's a starting point Europe. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hearing there's sort of um, moves afoot, I think, to extend from Europe also to include Africa. But I don't okay. think that wasn't part of the initial project. So I don't know how it will be incorporated. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. Because, um, you know, it, to me, coming from, from the water sector, it always seems like such an obvious place to to. Um, in better integrate earth observation and especially the higher resolution data. And I guess, um, I mean, yeah, we always have agriculture as an entry point. So it, it's it's often not, the focus of, often isn't water as such. Um, and I think partly uh, a lot of that challenge just becomes, comes from the fact that it's a resource that moves. It's, you know, it's not as easy to, to, to assess as, your your landscape elements are but why could i just ask you what what you found is you said you're looking at why um that is do you have you got to the stage of hand, having any answers as to why why it is that there isn't that focus no. um well i think well just but this is my personal opinion this is not an mm. analysis of sure. um i think the problem has been that well in my view the, the water sector has to rely heavily on, on complementary in situ data. Mm -hmm. So it can't just be an initiative from the EO side because yeah. earth observation just cannot meet all the, the information requirements of yeah. water managers. So I think that's why, because the Copernicus program has very much been pushed from the EO side. Mm -hmm. So my, yeah. my view is it's because EO is not... I wouldn't say it's never hundred percent capable in any field, but it's not, you know, it doesn't have the capability to, to really meet the needs of the water sector on its own. Yeah. That's, that's been kind of like just ignored a little bit, but that's, that's just a yeah. personal opinion. I don't know if anybody can substantiate that or agree with that or find a solution to that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would completely agree with that. You know, it's it's it is a challenge. And, and if you compare, you know, like I was saying, some of the terrestrial 
um, things. So forests, for example, are, are an obvious um, mm -hmm. resource to assess through earth observation, whereas water is more challenging. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also because you're never going to have a comprehensive assessment um, of water from earth observation. Yes, you might be able to do surface water like Kenneth showed us, or you might be able to look at water related ecosystems, but trying to look at that entire moving resource um, is it's it is hugely challenging and, and you need the in-situ data like you said mm. so um yeah and, and, and i guess that's why we always end up in this position of of having water assessed in individual sectors such as agriculture um i want to just yeah if, if any of our other um participants have any challenges that they face themselves in the use of earth observation data from water or yeah, please, uh, Rabia, um, do you want to unmute and just join in the discussion? There's there's just a few of us, so yeah, please go ahead. Hello, how are you all? Hi, hi. Uh, apologies for joining in late, but I'm a doctoral no student. I'm working on inland water quality monitoring using multi-source earth observation data. So what I find difficult is, you know, the different characteristics of the lakes, you know, how they differ in terms of turbidity or algal bloom production or the climatic variations. Mm -hmm. So I find it difficult to, you know, fit a general model to predict the water quality variables like chlorophyll A or turbidity or, you know, the algal bloom production. So even with in-situ data availability, I feel like we need a lot of climatic variables to, you know, sort of like define the reasons behind those values. And if you're just fitting a model with only chlorophyll A value, that won't be, that much accurate, in my opinion. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'm afraid water quality um, is not my field at all. So it's yeah, it's it's interesting to hear that you also have the challenges, um, and I guess possibly more so because for for water quality, you're working at a at a much higher resolution um, and much more context specific um, than the broader assessments. Where are you? Where are you working? Where's your research based? Um, I'm a PhD candidate at State University of New York. Syracuse, you can say like upstate New York, USA. Sorry, I, I meant which which uh, inland water bodies, which lakes? Oh, Finger Lakes, primarily. Sorry, which ones? I, did, I didn't catch that. Uh, Finger Lakes, you know, they're the like US. part of the Great Lakes, yeah, in okay. the US. So I guess, yeah, I mean, to me, you're actually, so you possibly have even better access to in situ data than in, in other parts of the world um, in the Great Lakes area. True, yes. Great. Um, even with the data availability, there can be like, you know, calibration issues across various sensors and things like that. Yeah, sure. Can I ask our other two participants, Zainab um, or Hassan, if you have um, any examples of how you've used um, earth observation data for any water related assessments, any projects, initiatives, programs you want to uh, share with us? Sorry, is it Hassan or Kazri? I can see you, but I can't see if you were trying to talk if you're unmuted. Okay, so in that case, maybe we can move on to the next question, um, which is, do you have any suggestions uh, for this community of practice? Anything you'd like to see coming out of it? What would be useful? Um, and is there any um, aspect of that that you would be interested in participating in, um, whether that's blogs or webinars? Um, podcasts. Is there anything of particular interest to you um, and any areas that um, you would be interested in contributing to? So, Rabia, um, as, a, as a doctoral student, um, I mean, I guess something like the community of practice might be useful for you to link up with, um, with others working in the same field. And is there any particular aspect of the community of practice that would that you think would be particularly useful? Mm, I'm not sure like if my answer really like 100% align with your question, but I feel like in this field, That's fine. Um, standardization is like one thing we could work, work on. Like even if we have the data, it's collected in so many different ways that you cannot really compare the results across different water bodies. Like it's either for even for water management or water quality. Like I think there is need for standardization, and that can like you know we as a researchers we can come up with those guidelines. Yeah, um, it's an interesting point because especially the water quality assessments are currently very context specific. Um, exactly. 
Yeah, and, 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 and I we guess... Cannot, um, and we cannot make any deductions, you know, without uh, cross comparisons. Like if all the research is based on uh, region specific sites, then it is not easy to deduce like what's, what is really going on. Right, yeah, sure. But I guess one of the, ch one of the challenges is at the moment with assessments of, um, of water quality not being so automated, you're always going to be uh, very reliant on having that in situ data. Um, and so in terms of standardizing it and, and designing an approach that is applicable, applicable across different types of, of lakes and, and water bodies, you'd need to first have access to quite a lot of in situ data um, to sure. parameterize yeah. the approach. Yes. And so maybe something like a community of practice could help in bringing together people working on different water bodies um, as a way to do that. True, we can have like webinars and, you know, come up with uh, ways where everyone is, you know, comfortable because yeah. definitely if it includes like very high-end product, like very expensive uh, radiometers or reflectometers, mm -hmm. then obviously not everyone or every researcher in every country across the globe cannot afford that. Yeah. That matters as yeah. well, the, you know, access yeah. to the equipment, the reliable equipment. Yes, no, that is a challenge. Yeah, it's not it's not something that we can be that we can address, for example, through, you know, through some simple uh, crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we can definitely do data sharing mm. so that, you know, we can develop a database which can be helpful for researchers across the world. I mean, personally, I think that's it, it's an important part of a community of practice is seeing how we can build on each other's experiences to strengthen and operationalize. Um, yeah, the more local applications. Um, Nina, what about you? Um, is there anything in particular that uh, you would like to get out of the community of practice? Or are you just listening into some of the presentations today in relation to the project? Yeah, um, I mean, it's more that way around. Although, mm. I mean, maybe the community of practice would be a good source of, you know, information as far as we can carry out a survey or interviews or something like that it depends what the the um uh, profile of the members are you know because mm -hmm. of our focus that's mainly on europe at the moment you sure. know we, we have to we have to keep that in mind so i think we've made our way through our yeah the questions that were set out to us so now i'm going to give you one last chance in case you had anything you wanted to add to any parts of the conversation or any experiences you wanted to share and you don't have to talk um if that's a challenge you can just put it in the chat but we'll be really interested in hearing from you um and then onka betsy is there anything else we need to do here how do we do we just do we leave or do we get put back um we get put back okay get put back, so then yeah. everyone can yet yeah, take yeah. five i guess we've got about five minutes i think yeah yeah is that okay? Is there anything else that you need, Anka Betsy, for um, the reporting back, or is that okay? No, I am good. I was able to capture the point. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Rabia. Thank you. Thank you. Just a housekeeping question. So, will mm -hmm. the recording be available for the session? Anka Betsy, do you know? Yes, it will be available. Everything has been recorded and it will be available. Yeah. Welcome to Breakout 4. I'm Yunusa Bombajaswa. I'm a research manager with the Water Research Commission in South Africa. I'm also really in, heavily involved in um, earth observation based projects for water quality monitoring in South Africa and in Southern Africa. So um, like Erin said, we do want to share our experiences for the first part of this uh, breakout session. We would just like for you to share your experiences on some of the earth observation projects or work that you're involved in. And I think because we're quite an, um, not a big group, maybe what we could do is just do a quick round of introductions and then we can um, start that first part of the session if that's okay with everyone. <laughs> so um, Santos, am I pronouncing that well? Hi, good morning. My name is Santos Paunero. I'm the head of innovation of uh, Spanish utility and we have uh, um, a million uh, clients, more or less. And uh, we haven't started with Earth observation, but uh, we are looking for 
for an opportunity to um, to look into our lakes, into our reservoirs, um, for for information about uh, cyanobacteria or or other um, or um, agar blooms. Yeah. Thank you for that, um, Jody. Yeah. Good morning, Jordi. Just... Yeah. Jordi is uh, the uh, Catalan version of uh, George. Good morning, I'm from Spanish company, Coladasa. We develop uh, automation and control systems for water quality monitoring. We are making a trial of a, a project with a head observation system and a, a water quality profiler in them to view the utility or the use of uh, intelligent artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence to evaluate the quality uh, thanks to uh, space observation and online monitoring of water in dam. Thank you so much. And then we have Jampei. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Jampei uh, from Japan, uh, uh, Japanese startup company. So we are developing a small uh, SAR satellite. And also my back, my personal backstory is a hydrology and hydrodynamics. So that's why I'm interested in this webinar. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jampei. And then Arjun. Uh, hello, everyone. Good day to good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Arjun Yadav. Uh, completed my master's in water and wastewater engineering, having a decade of experience from defense tech, aviation, and water and wastewater industry. Seven years I've worked uh, significantly from design, operation, commissioning, and water and wastewater industry itself, and uh, before coming to United Kingdom. Great. Thank you so much, Arjun. And then we have Aziza. Hello everyone, my name is Aziza. I'm a researcher at Hydro System Engineering Research Unit at the University of Oulu, Finland. Uh, we are studying um, alteration of uh, uh, river regime and uh, its effect on uh, estuary in wetlands and uh, on uh, uh, land like uh, locked lakes uh, and direct lakes in the uh, Middle East and Central Asia. So we also are uh, using um, Earth observation um, data and also in-situ data. And uh, these two regions lack some in-situ data. So we have issues with this, especially hy hydrological data. Is it me? I think I, list, I missed the last part, Aziza. Mm, I think she mentioned hydrological data and then that yeah, was that's it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, she finished the hydrological data. Did you, did you get it? Did you hear it, Eunice? No, I didn't hear that. No. Oh, oh okay. Okay. So um, we have an issue with uh, the in situ hydrological data. So this data is not sh openly shared, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, rem the remote sensing data is not uh, good enough to be used instead of the in situ data. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Aziza, for that. Okay. So I think then maybe we can um, jump in then um, to share more specifics around maybe some of the projects that have um, caused some challenges. Um, I think I like the, the variety of kind of water resources we're dealing with. We've got wetlands, dams, um, different applications, both from an academic point of view and more of a utilities point of view um, in terms of also that research transfer. And I think Catherine touched onto it, how Earth observation is always at least, I think it was Lisa who said that Earth observation is a growing um, domain, but really translating it to utilities for them to use it and see it as a, as a valid way for water quality management is a little bit difficult. And it's also something we are struggling with here um, in South Africa, although it's working. We do know, obviously, there are problems with data collection sometimes, whether you're going to use Sentinel, what, um, you know, um, in terms of cost as well, financial implications. But um, I think if we probably have some ideas how to overcome that, um, that, we, that we could share among each other, that would be good to help the community of practice in general. So don't know who wants to start off first. <laughs> Maybe Jampe, because I think I like the angle that you're coming from when you introduced yourself. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, actually, so I don't have such a specific project, but uh, uh, my personal backstory is a hydrometrical one. So I do, I use a uh, uh, remote sensing for the uh, water surface area uh, estimation um, for dam. 
Um, so uh, estimating such a water surface one, so we can uh, estimate the water levels for each dam. So, um, and also we are using the INSA technology, so uh, land slide uh, can yeah cause the uh, sedimentation. So uh, we approach such a so total integrated approach for the dam uh, management. Uh, so it's not totally related to today's topic, but uh, I just have such a uh, project actually. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, if you want, I try to explain my project and my problem. Uh, <laughs> like I say, during many years, we have been developing monitoring, real time online monitoring systems for water quality. One of our clients is uh, public administrations that manage dams that are used for drinking water. Uh, the problem is that uh, this dam is very big. You cannot measure everything everywhere at the time. So uh, finally, what we uh, joined with the public administration the site is to monitor the profile of the water quality near the intake of the water to the drinking water treatment plant. So we have uh, in some places more than 10 years of profiles in general, every four times per day, because we have seen that it's not necessary to have more information. There's no evolution in the water quality uh, so fast in a dam, at least in the Spanish dam. But the problem is that we just can monitor one place that is near the, out, the intake to the water treatment plant. So we are trying to see if, thanks to the satellite observation, we are able to make forecasts of all the quality all around the dam. We know there are some problems because one of the problems is the frequency of the image. You don't have so much frequency. You just have one image every, if everything goes well every five days. If uh, there are clouds or there are rain, uh, then you have less image. The second problem is the depth of the image you get. Uh, in general, you just can get the image from the surface of the water, not of the underground water. So uh, these two things is that we are trying to see if thanks to the artificial intelligence, we can join with the online real-time profile to see if we can predict these algal blooms. In the previous presentation, they, are, they have said that this is not a problem in, in Europe. It's a problem in Europe, at least in the south of Europe, where we have a heat weather, or, or so we have this problem. Uh, and this is what we are trying to do at this moment. Uh, as I have said, we have the profilers installed in a lot of dams in Spain, and we are starting to make the analysis of the image. Fortunately, we have history of image and and data from profilers, so now we are seeing if there's possibility to to make this forecast or this prevision of problems in that. Thank you, Jordi. I think for, for us here in South Africa, also we have a lot of issues with our dams. Um, eutrophication is a big problem, obviously, because we do have a lot of agricultural activities. And um, there's also been the whole upstream story. So um, upstream management to change policy there, it's difficult. So now we are trying to sort of solve a solution from the once it has happened, you know, instead of really dealing with um, emissions and you know um water quality from that point of view you know what comes out at your point um source point so for um for eutrophication we do also have um we started this cyano lakes um it's an app that we a mobile app that we've been successfully been able to use to monitor eutrophication in quite a number of our large dams but like you said the the surface area is in resolution is where the problem is so the bigger dams, it's mu it's much easier to do, um, and when you do obviously in situ monitoring, it correlates nicely with what we're seeing on the app. And this is also web based. Uh, app, I'm sorry, app, um, computer based application as well. But your smaller dams, where uh, it's managed by farmers in um, you know especially where they are involved in export production, then it becomes a problem. So you find that yes, water utilities can use it nicely because they have quite large dams. But when it comes to smaller dams and the resolution. Um, is not 
uh, as great. And obviously it's also a paid service. So then the financial um, costs comes into play as well. But at least we do have something that we've been able to translate nicely where even for recreational use, you know, if you wanted to go and swim somewhere, you could also download it on your phone and can give you an, an, an health risk level basically to say, okay, it's safe to swim in the water today or maybe to roll if you wanted or fish. But yeah, so we, we are, we're, we're still struggling as well, but at least we are making movements when it comes to eutrophication. I think for us, it's the other water quality parameters that we are still struggling with especially with maybe some of our emerging contaminants and um, things like that yeah thank you for that um i don't know arjun santos aziza uh, hello yeah uh, thanks for all your insights uh, see with regards to utilizing the satellites and uh, processing the data so uh, to be honest i didn't get an appropriate answer in the session which i asked the question when you're having loads of data coming in and what I heard from Maria that it is not being done on regular basis, but not annual basis. That's what I heard, but uh, I didn't really quite get it. If you're accumulating so much of data and you're filtering out annually, it won't make any good uh, desired output. You have to keep on regularly cleaning up, filtering and targeting those data, which is essential. Those which are not required, let's say 80 to 90%, you should immediately delete it. So it's not essential. So you have to keep those things which are most essential one. So that has to be processed in milliseconds every now and then. So I really don't know how it has been done annually. It's quite not clear. This one thing. Second thing is uh, when you're uh, accessing the data from the ground to the satellite, so it's only a one direct link. I, I don't think it will be sufficient enough to get their objectives. You have to keep separate segregated uh, stations, let's say underground sensors, uh, drones, aerial drones for certain uh, surface water, for, let's say on surface water, on surfacing aerial drones, particular contaminants, underground water, a certain level, underground drones with sensors for, for XYZ contaminants. And uh, let's say for buoys, let's say like you can install buoys in the uh, river uh, beds and uh, where the, let's say when it, before it reaches the treatment plants, uh, 10 kilometers in the river basins, uh, buoys, floating buoys where it can really observe all the contaminants. So these data process and the aerial drones will collect it and that will send to the satellite. So by this, each and every step by step, there will be a segregated transformation and data storage and data cleaning method. And overall, it can be accumulated in satellite and give a proper uh, output. So I don't think it's going to be only one centralized. You cannot uh, get everything. So me being uh, having an experience in operating the plants, looking at the SCADA data, it was not that easy. So as and when you decentralize it, as and when you look into it thoroughly, then only things will go better. And uh, according to ex uh, different geographical trends, you need uh, particular sensors. You cannot have one sensor, you have to customize a lot and you have to customize with its coding, programming, and you have to calibrate it at precise levels. What, what what contaminants you're targeting at what level it should be calibrated. So there's a lot of uh, stuff. So yeah, and uh, this needs uh, too much involvement. You need many people together, to, uh, skilled professionals to involve those who have worked in the site, who are experienced in field work. I think those people should uh, come in forward to pro uh, pro promote this in a bigger way because it's really a fantastic technology and futuristic as well. By implementing this, you will get rid of all the chemical-based testing and the huge laborious method that is involved. So I'm really support, great supporter of this tech. And also I am strongly advocating that AI should be fully implemented in water and wastewater and water industry at its highest level. And I'm happy to help uh, anyone on voluntary basis or on uh, internship basis and uh, looking forward for any opportunity. Thank you so much, Arjun. And actually, that was quite a nice lead up then to the um, second part of our breakout, which basically we want to find out um, from our participants um, what you can contribute to the community of practice, um, whether it's through maybe webinars. Um, Arjun, you've also mentioned the experiences and training that you can provide. Um, then there's also podcast series, um, white papers. So just different ways of um, of contributing to the community of practice, addressing these kinds of issues that we've picked up. Because I think just from our small group here, we can see that 
different countries are at different stages with regard to application of earth observation. So you don't need to have to walk the same road that maybe another geographic location has walked. You can just leapfrog and maybe know how to better manage your data, like Arjun is saying, or how um, Jordi gave his example of maybe starting off first with just one, um, looking at one intake, building your data for a very long time so that you already know how your models look like before you transit to earth observation. So I think if we can maybe have, if you have any suggestions on how you think you can contribute to the COP, that would be useful. And obviously that information will then be made available to everybody who is part of this community. Maybe we can start with Santos. <laughs> Hi again. Hi. Um, uh, I'm just, for the moment, I'm just listening because we don't have any project uh, in progress. Um, what uh, Arjun uh, has said uh, is very, very interesting because uh, it's it, it gives us a lot of ideas uh, because uh, we have now a, a contract where we go to our reservoirs, to our dams to take samples of the water to know if we have uh, uh, bloom, algae blooms or whatever. And that uh, takes, a, uh, takes us uh, a lot of people to go there. Uh, uh, there are security risk there to go with, uh, with a boat. And um, we want to avoid that. But uh, with all the uh, contributions that you have made at, at the moment, uh, what I have learned is that uh, we have to work in parallel with this uh, continuing taking samples and at the same time uh, taking this data um, from earth observation or drones or, or the boys that the, the book the yeah to, to take the boys to to, uh, to take the sample and and to work in parallel so to know that this this data take, taken from from earth observation are feasible are, are reliable. So to us, it's very, very interesting. Maybe Sanchez, I don't know how you guys will document that. Are you, um, are you publishing or are you reporting it somewhere that um, everyone can have access to? Because I think maybe quite a number of people in this community will also be at the starting stage, you know? Uh, repeat the, 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 the question, please. So I was saying that are you how are you guys documenting this process of you um, you guys getting involved into transitioning from your traditional monitoring methods to earth observation? Is there a way? Is there some way you are reporting it? Because no, not not for the moment. Happy? We are thinking okay. how to do it, and we mm -hmm. are just we are attending at this kind of events so to mm -hmm. learn and to uh, to do it for for in a better way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well said. Thank you. Good. And then Aziza, maybe I just wanted to follow up with the work that you've been doing around wetlands. I think also that's quite nice. I mean, that those are the kinds of boundaries we deal with um, in terms of our water resource quality. So it's not necessarily your, your water, but it's an important issue when it comes to obviously water quality regulation. Uh, I wanted to talk about other projects that I have. It's mm -hmm. on urban lakes. Uh, in Olu, we have two small lakes uh, that are mainly used for recreational purposes. And we also have algae blooms there. And um, uh, one of my projects that I'm just waiting for the, <laughs> the grant uh, to implement, but I started some uh, monitoring already. So uh, we want to make a digital twin, so these lakes. I, I think all of you know this uh, concept. Um, and. Um, and we placed uh, sensors. Uh, now only we had a budget for the dissolved oxygen sensors. So uh, basically those sensors take information every um, 10 minutes, uh, but uh, I, I can't directly get it, this information from the sensors. Like I, I placed it in November and now I will take them out after the ice breaks in April and then I can collect the information. So it's not basically a digital twin because uh, in the digital twin technologies, you have immediate, you need the immediate data, uh, like constant flow of data. With remote sensing, it's better, but also we don't have the like satellites flowing <laughs> through this, uh, like uh, above those uh, lakes every day or like uh, every hour. So we uh, have to uh, combine all this data, in-situ data, those sensor data, 
and we also use need to use this 5G, 6G technologies and uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, to combine all the data and not doing it manually or like collecting and filtering it manually, but to make it uh, like a process that is constant and uh, automatic. Uh, but uh, we are just starting this process. Okay, and with you guys also, are you going to be reporting it somewhere or are you documenting the process somewhere? Is there like a website maybe for the project? Uh, we are going to make an app, uh, an app? for the okay. city. Yeah, for the city okay. because uh, mm -hmm. these lakes are used for the swimming. Okay. So we uh, we will share this data with the city and with residents. Uh, okay. We also made a um, uh, like a survey among the residents to find out their opinion, and uh, they are already uh, told us that um, they can observe algae blooms. There was a fish death events as well. Uh, so there is a problem with water quality. Mm. Uh, but people also are mainly concerned on the color of water because in this northern uh, lakes and rivers we have the brown water yeah. issue okay right. in Finland yeah oh. so there, there are many issues that we have to look at it and also the satellites uh, can be quite useful in this case okay thank you Arjun your hand is up uh, th thanks Aziza for bringing your uh, uh, information uh, see what I'm bring, uh, like to uh, bring up on uh, on my experiences. When you are addressing, when you are ut utilizing the sensors and targeting any uh, measurements, it also depends upon how are you targeting, why are you targeting. Let's say that you are targeting contaminants, organic or inorganic contaminants or microbial contaminants. Let's say you are targeting crypto or algae. The size of the crypto. What's its heat signature? What's its dimension? Whether you are going related to heat signature based sensors or optical imaging based sensors. So let's say you're going for an AI ML algorithm. So it has, you have to feed the proper data to the algorithm that what is the crypto? What is the size of it? How does it seem? What is the density? What is the measurement? Based on that, you start collecting as a client, you have to calibrate as per that. So it's not that um, like just put a sensor and get everything. So it, it also depends upon what data feed that you're giving into those algorithms that the sensors will detect and as you calibrate it, it will verify it properly. So there is some, uh, I think we should be more deep and uh, uh, more specific in how we address our issues rather than being generic. So that's what I would like to bring in. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Um, we're going to be take, taken back to the main um, room right now, but I think the discussions that we had were really good. Thank you.